Here's an area that I find really fascinating, just uh, breaking right now. So this is a really interesting paper by Stephen Kingsmore and his colleagues. It was published earlier this year. And they said, wait a minute, if we can sequence at a reasonably cheap rate, uh, could we make the pre-conception uh, uh, diagnosis? So we all know about prenatal diagnosis, but now we're talking about before you get pregnant. Can we use carrier testing? Now, carrier testing was actually developed at Johns Hopkins for Tay-Sachs disease. But could we do this broadly? So they said, well, wait a minute. There, let's enumerate the number of disorders which are really difficult to treat or impossible to treat and have their childhood onset, have their onset in childhood. And they counted up 448 of those disorders for which the gene was known. So then they said, okay, uh, we can use next generation sequencing and we can use which, what is called targeted capture. So we can capture those 437 genes on a, an array and then sequence them using next generation sequencing and ask if these adults who are about to enter the reproductive arena, uh, are carriers for any of these more than 400 rare disorders. Uh, and we can do it for less than a, a dollar a test, okay? Or less than a thousand bucks a couple is the way I think about it. It's really a couple test here. Uh, so they did that, and what they found in 104 unrelated individuals is that each of those 104 unrelated individuals were carriers, heterozygotes for deleterious alleles for about three of the disease genes that they checked. So that, of course, you'd say, does your prospective spouse, are they carriers for that same disease allele? And if so, then you would have a one in four risk of having that disorder. Now, we could make the diagnosis after you've had the baby. Uh, and most of these are very difficult to treat if, in fact, we can't treat them at all. So uh, they posit the idea, if we do this, could we dramatically reduce the incidence of uh, these rare, difficult to treat autism or recessive diseases? So there are a lot of ethical issues, a lot of other challenges, but I think this is uh, very promising, and I'd, I'd love to see many diseases that we currently struggle with be prevented rather than uh, struggling. So I'm not going to say uh, much about complex diseases, but there has been this rap that genome-wide association studies haven't found things as, that are as strong a risk as we'd like, but uh, I think that's maybe in many places the party line, but I urge you to look carefully and rigorously at that literature. Here's a paper by David Goldstein and his colleagues, and they're asking uh, if people have hepatitis C, how do they respond to treatment? And treatment is with a form of interferon, and he finds a single, single nucleotide polymorphism that has a tremendous effect on how you respond to treatment. Treatment is measured by sustained viral uh, reduction, reduction in viral load. And this, your genotype at this uh, locus here, it's either, you either have a T or a C. Here in Europeans, if you're homozygous for the uh, favorable allele, uh, your uh, sustained viral response is about three, two and a half to three times better. P-value on that is 10 to the minus 25. It holds across all populations. If you lump all the populations, the P-value is, I can't read that, 10 to the minus 20 something or other. But it's, it's highly significant. So you can do this genotype and ask, is this patient going to respond to this conventional therapy or not? Is there something else I should use? <clears throat> Similarly, here's a whole genome association study that looked for uh, myopathy as a complication for statins. We're all taking statins these days. Occasional patients get severe myopathy. A single, uh, single nucleotide variant, if it, you're heterozygous for that variant, you're four times more likely to get myopathy. If you're homozygous for that variant, you're 17 times more likely to get uh, uh, the, the uh, myopathy. So we can use that information right now to guide our uh, treatment uh, with this uh, medicine. Uh, the last example of this I'll give you is <coughs> a new paper. And it's not that, that it's just an interesting idea to me. So currently, all men get uh, prostate, a PSA test to see if you're at risk for developing a prostate <coughs> cancer. And your value on that PSA is judged against an, a number. And that number is supplied across the entire population. Now, if you ask the geneticist, you'd say that number is too low for some people and too high for other people. It's an average, right? So can we figure out a more accurate way to do it? So this is a paper from the Decode Genetics. And they said 40% of the variation of PSA levels is genetic. It's influenced by six genes at six different positions. They looked at 3,834 men with PSA levels and prostate biopsies, and they suggested an individualized PSA cutoff value. In other words, here's the 
value we currently use, this value is too high for some people and it's too low for other people. So why not make a better value that's individualized? Some of my uh, ur urologic colleagues said, oh, we'll just biopsy everybody anyways. Well, of course, uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, so maybe we ought to do this uh, in a more intelligent way. Now, one big area of, uh, that's moving very fast here, and I see my time is short, I'll just give you a heads up, uh, is using next generation sequencing, this whole genome biology, to find disease genes. I told you we have 2,500 disease genes. But now since we can use this uh, sort of whole genome sequencing or whole exome, that is all the coding parts of the genome sequencing, we could imagine that we could solve almost every Mendelian disorder. So Mendelian disorders are very rare, but they're the things that are inherited like Mendel's pea plants, uh, like Mendel worked out in pea plants, has autosomal recessive endowment traits. So there's an RFA that was left by NHGRI to solve all Mendelian disease. All you have to do is collect all of the patients around the world that have Mendelian phenotypes and sequence a representative of each of those diagnoses, find out what the disease gene is, and then learn something about that disease and also the biology around that gene product. Um, so this is going to happen. The, uh, a number of centers went in, Hopkins went in. Uh, we'll find out later this year whether or not uh, Hopkins does it, but somebody's going to do it. Let me just give you briefly how this would work. So here's the disease that we looked at, something called metachondromatosis causes skeletal deformities. It's inherited by, as a dominant trait. Here's a pedigree. <clears throat> All dark thin symbols are patients with metachondromatosis. So we said, well, we could use linkage, we could use candidate gene studies, but wait a minute, why don't we just sequence the genome of this person? And then we could look and see if we could find the variants. Now when you do that, we're responsible for the phenotype. Now when you do that, you find a lot of variants. Remember I said we all have three or four million so you have to have some strategy to sort through the variants and figure out which is the responsible one. So what we did, this family is not big enough to do a meaningful genetic linkage, but it is big enough to eliminate parts of the genome. So we did a, an inexpensive linkage technique amongst those individuals, 12 individuals. So we did whole genome sequence on the proband and linkage on 12 individuals. We found six different uh, regions of the genome that had some evidence of positive linkage. So we focused our search in those regions and forgot about the rest of the genome. And lo and behold, in one of those, we found a disease gene, which is called PTPN11. Uh, and it's a gene that's well known to geneticists because different, ver different alleles in that locus cause a syndrome called Noonan syndrome. These are all alleles that have gain of function, mutants that have gain of function. This allele has loss of function. It's in the RASMAP kinase signaling pathway, which is important in many forms of cancer. So we learned something about this disease, and we learned something about the biology of this pathway. The whole thing took about six weeks. Now, what does this mean for medicine? So this is what I thought I was going to be doing when I decided to go into medicine, uh, going around with my black bag. All of my stuff would be in my black bag, uh, and I would go from farmhouse to farmhouse. This is a picture by uh, uh, Eugene Smith a physician named Dr. Sarani in the 40s on rounds in Kansas. So <clears throat> we know that medicine has changed radically. Uh, one of the problems is this uh, tsunami of information that medical students have to learn and physicians have to learn how to respond to it. Uh, and thinking along these lines and thinking about human variation was the things that led Bart Childs, as you already heard, to propose this new uh, curriculum. So how would we respond? We'd like to teach the med medical students a context of principles that will last and which they can move facts on and off this context of principles. We'd like to integrate basic and clinical science. We'd like to give them strong intellectual rigor so that they can evaluate purported facts and decide whether or not they really are something you can hang your hat on or not. We'd like them to think variation is the norm, not the exception. Uh, that disease is the result of genes and environmental variables. And they're going to have to integrate masses of data around individuals. That is, they're going to have to be savvy in computation. So if you want to read about a first effort at this, this came from Stanford, but uh, a prominent uh, uh, biomedical scientist had his genes, uh, genome sequenced because he had a family history of sudden death. And really they struggled a lot with interpreting that information. So we know that this, the challenge is big. <coughs> 